Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that your word, Lord, just strengthens us. Your word always brings truth into our life, and it, it shows us what we need to change and address, and we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that accompanies your word, that brings the transformation in our life. I pray that you would do a work in our hearts this morning, and that you would speak to each and every single one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last week I started a series called Heaven to Earth. We've been speaking about how we as Christians, as believers, God intended for us to experience heaven on this earth. And that even though heaven is a destination, is a place that we're going to go to, is a, is a real place, we'll be speaking more about bringing heaven into our earthly lives and experiencing what God has promised through His Word. Uh, that we could experience that in our every single day life and that, and, and that we, we even looked and we, we like showed some, sta- some stats and some information about how people, some people don't believe heaven's a real place. That 71% of Christians believe that, that heaven is a real place and 15% believe that it's no, it doesn't exist and 14% don't know that it exists. But we, we, heaven does, does exist and, and the Bible in the book of Revelations speaks about what place heaven is going to be, what kind of a place heaven's going to be. And uh, we're not going to get too much into what kind of a place it's going to be, but rather getting into how we can experience it in our every single day life. And, and some things that we experience here on earth, uh, they, they may not going to change. Like, the, for example, the, the Bible says that in heaven there's streets, amen? And so, yeah, on this earth we have streets. So, so there are going to be some kind of things that are, are similar in heaven then to what we experience in earth and 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 when i was thinking about this i came across this joke which i thought i'd share with you about heaven it says that at the end of the age when all the believers were standing in line waiting to get to heaven and the angel gabriel appeared and said i want all the men to form two lines over here and one line will be for the men who were the true heads of their household the other line will be for the men whose wives dominated them Gabriel continued, and now we need all of, and Gabriel continued, and he said, now we need all of the women to report to Mary and Martha on that side. So the woman left, and while the men hurriedly formed two lines, the line of men who were dominated by their wives was seemingly unending. The line of men who were the true heads of their household had just one man standing in it. (laughs) Gabriel looked at this, and he said to the first line, you men, You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You were appointed to be heads of the household and you have not fulfilled your purpose. All of you, there is only one man who obeyed. Gabriel goes to this man and he says to him and he turned to him and he said, how did you come to be in this line? The man sheepishly replied, my wife told me to stand here. (laughs) Some things never change in life. But we're speaking about the kingdom of heaven and we're speaking about how we, as Christians, we can live a life that's so different and unique to anybody else on this planet because God gives you and I the access to bring heaven into our situation. That we don't have to be defeated, we don't have to be discouraged, we don't have to be living in fear because the kingdom of heaven is what God has given you and I. And when we speak about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they're interchangeable. And when we speak about the kingdom of heaven, what we're really speaking about is, is living life God's way. Is living life God's way. And Jesus put it like this in Matthew 6, 33. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is not saying that there's not an importance on material things and the things that we need to live our lives. And that he has a problem with us being blessed and, and having material possessions. But what he is saying is that but in the kingdom of God, it's different to this world. Because the people in this world, they seek possessions. They seek materialism to give them identity and to give them a sense of belonging and acceptance. He said, but in my kingdom, it's so different. My kingdom doesn't work like that. My kingdom is you seek me first, you put me first, and then all of these things that everybody else is worried about in life, they just come as a byproduct of you seeking me first. In actual fact, when you seek God first, you don't have to work as hard as you work right now to get all of those things to come into your life. It's a byproduct of God's blessing in our life. You see, the word seek there in the Greek is the word zetio. It means to seek after, seek for, aim, strive after. It means to investigate how it works. And so in order for us to experience the kingdom of heaven in our lives on this earth, we need to investigate and know how the kingdom of God operates. And then in everything that we do, seek to achieve the principles and apply them 
in our life as we grow in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, a guy by the name of Alan Redpath made this statement. He says, before we can pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray, my kingdom go. And I really believe that that is so profound because we, we want God's kingdom. We want to experience the kingdom of heaven, but we also want to serve the kingdom, our own, ident- our own ideals and agenda. Amen. And, and Jesus says, no, no, what you're going to do is you're going to experience me. You're going to experience what heaven has for your life. All you have to do is you've got to start seeking me and start putting my principles in place. Start seeking the way I would do things. You see, the kingdom of heaven, one thing that we know about the kingdom of heaven is that it's a kingdom of divine order. It's a kingdom of divine order, and God blesses order, amen? And so, in actual fact, the, the, when we start to get that divine order in our life, and we start to pursue God, and we start to seek God in our life, we, blessing is just a byproduct. And, and the reality is this, is that the more you pursue the kingdom of God, the more you pursue God in your life, and it's not difficult, it's just saying, God, I'm choosing your way instead of my way. Because really, our way gets us into trouble. Amen? And so... We seek God. The more we seek God, the more we prosper in life. The more we experience God's goodness in our life, His faithfulness in our life. And so God is a God of order. This is what we understand. And the very first time we see God speaking in Genesis, the world is in a mess. The Bible says that darkness covered the earth. That word darkness is a a Hebrew word that means chaos. That chaos ruled. But what did God do? Before He blessed anything, He created order. And when you start seeking God's kingdom and you start chasing the kingdom of heaven, you know what starts to happen by default in your life? Order starts to set into your life. And then the Bible says that when God created everything, he blessed it. In order for you to get blessing, there needs to be divine order. Because a lot of people are like, God, would you bless this? Would you bless my life? But your life, like really, some of the areas of our life need, need order. Amen. God, would you bless my finances? God says, I'll bless your finances. Just get the order right. Put me first. God, would you bless my health? I'll I'll get your health right in order. Just eat the right food. (laughs) So it's a a kingdom of divine order, amen? And so this morning, uh, Jesus, we realize that through the word and through scripture that, that God puts no limit on how you and I can experience the kingdom of God. There is no limit to the promises and the blessings of God in our life, amen? The limit comes from our side. Jesus said this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is saying that you can pray and you can ask that the kingdom of heaven come down on this earth and there will be no limit to it. There will be no, uh, there will be no limitations on your life for you to experience that in your life. And, and each of us can experience the king and his kingdom in our everyday life. Amen. Uh, and as a Christian, this is what we realize. As a Christian, we are designed and we've been created to bring heaven to earth. Really, you've been created to bring heaven to earth, and your life is different to the way it was before. When you got saved, you got born again, uh, your life changed. God's plan for your life is that he would take it and radically transform it. So so we realize that one thing we know about God is that God is the God of more. Okay, God is the God of more. The Bible says that when Jesus, when it was prophesied about Jesus coming to earth, it said that to his kingdom there will be no end. His government will have no end. So God is a God of more. And so God planned in Israel, when we look at the children of Israel, we see Israel is a picture and a type of the church. Whenever you see the word Israel in the Bible, it speaks about a picture of the church, the New Testament church. And so God said, while Israel was in Egypt, they were in slavery. God had more for their life. God didn't want them to live in slavery. God didn't want them to be confounded and constricted by the, the culture of Egypt and, the, and, the, and just the religious beliefs of Egypt. So God had more for them. So God said, I want to take you from slavery and I want to take you to the promised land. And so what happened was that God delivered them from slavery. When you got born again, you were no longer a slave to sin. You're not as long as sin comes against you, but you're not its slave. Okay, so what happens is God says, I, I deliver them from Israel. Where they go? They go into the wilderness, out of Egypt, should I say. They go into the wilderness. And, and the, the, Egypt, what we realize about Egypt, sorry, is that while they were slaves, they never had enough. They were dependent on Egypt. But when they got into the wilderness, they had just enough. God fed them every day. God looked after them. He took care of them every day. But God didn't want them just to have enough. God wanted them to have more than enough. He wanted them to go to the promised land. The promised land was a land flowing with milk and honey and all the things that they needed to 
achieve in their life and experience the blessing of God. God does exactly the same in our life. The challenge is this, is that they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And, and so this is what I realized is that many of us today as Christians, we get saved, we get free from Egypt, from our sin life, from the kingdom of darkness. But then we spend years wandering. We spend years wondering, and the question is this, is that too many people, should I say the statement is this, is that too many people are settled and satisfied with wondering instead of pursuing and prospering. So are you settled and satisfied, or are you pursuing and prospering? Because you can't be both. Ask the person next to you, are you settled and satisfied, or are you pursuing and prospering? Okay, that was a real thing I asked you to do. Are you settled or satisfied or are you pursuing and prospering? Because when we pursue the kingdom of God, we're going to experience God's kingdom. And it's a new God. You see, what God had planned is he had a whole new life. He had a whole new life planned for Israel. God didn't want them to be slaves. And when you get born again, God had a new, through his son, Jesus Christ, he had a brand new life for you. Your old life was not your normal way of living anymore. You have a new normal. And that new normal speaks about a, a new way of living life. A new way of experiencing God. And, and, and there was some confusion amongst the Pharisees about how this is all going to work out. And, and so in John chapter 3, there was a man by the name of Nicodemus. He, he says to Jesus, he says, uh, explain this born again to me. And so in John 3, it says there, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, because he was too scared to go in the day, and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with you. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can somebody be born again when they're old? Nicodemus said, asked. I really think that that is a phenomenal question to ask. Because he's thinking about heavenly things with an earthly mindset. Like, how do, how do I as an adult go back into my mom's womb and get born again? That would be awkward for everyone. <laughs> Jesus answered, very truly. Sure, look what he says. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And so what Jesus is saying is that, that experiencing the kingdom of heaven is, is through, how do we do that? It's by getting born again. Born again is not a physical transaction that takes place. It's a spiritual intervention that takes place in our life and a rebirthing of our spirit. And when that spirit is reborn and your life is reborn, you still have the same physical body. Sometimes you still have the same thoughts, but you are a new person and God has designed a new life and a new normal for your life. Your old way of living church is very different to the new life that God has for you. And you cannot experience and experience what heaven has for you when you are trying to relate to God with your old way of living. We have old thoughts that come our way, things that come in our mind. There's a difference between being justified. Justified means you're made right with God through salvation. Sanctified means it's a process that you go through in your life. It's a journey that God takes you on to get you to the place He's called you to be and for you to become all that He's destined and promised for your life. It's a process that we experience and take on in our life. And so there's a new normal that, that, that comes into our life. The, the way we used to live is, is uniquely different to the way we are called to live right now. God calls us to live in freedom when we get born again. No longer are we slaves or subjected to what the world is telling us to do. No longer are we subjected to poverty, fear, lack, any of that because God has a new life for you and I. Your norm has changed. Tell, tell the person next to you your norm has changed the new normal has come in and you know when we talk about a new normal it's talking about adapting and changing to the environment that you've been placed in and when the kingdom of heaven is on the inside of us there is an adapting that needs to take place in our life there is a new way of living that God calls us if you think about a baby just think about a baby when a baby is in its mother's womb and the baby is at eight months up until that eight month or nine month period that that baby is living in the mother's womb, it has everything it needs to survive. God provides miraculously for that baby to experience life in the womb. But life in the womb is limiting. And while it's in its womb, it, it can survive in water. 
It has this umbilical cord that's like food on tap. Like you just, and you like fill yourself up, baby. It's like awesome. Thank God we don't have that right now. But this baby has everything it needs to survive. But how many of you know that when, when that baby is birthed, in that moment of birth, everything that was normal has become has been, has been taken away and there is a new normal that comes into that baby's life it blows my mind that a baby who could live in liquid can now breathe air that's the greatest miracle and but this is what we realize is that now baby has to learn to inhale and exhale the baby has to learn to adopt to the sunlight because it was in a womb and the baby needs to exercise muscles and needs to learn to grow. The norm has changed. No longer is it sitting in a restricted, confined environment because while it's in that restricted and confined environment, there are limitations on it. In actual fact, if it stays in the womb, it will eventually die. But when it gets birthed, it suddenly has its potential to reach. It has the potential to reach its full potential capabilities and possibilities that God intended. When you came into the kingdom of God, God never limited your life. In actual fact, when you came into the kingdom of God, you were birthed into an experience that will create such potential and promise on your life that you could never achieve before you knew Christ Jesus. And so the kingdom of God helps us in living in the kingdom of God. We reach our full potential. Amen. And so here's the deal, church. Here's the deal. Many of us are struggling to achieve the potential that God has promised and put on our lives because some of us are still in the womb. And what I mean by still in the womb, I'm speaking about dealing with God as if we were still in the world. And God just wants us to, to trust Him with His Word and seek first God's kingdom. Just seek first God's kingdom. What does that mean? It means finding out how God's kingdom operates and then living it. Finding how God sees your life. You see, God puts such a huge value on your life and on my life. And when we start to seek that value and seek how God does that, how, he, how His kingdom functions and operates, we start to see God's hand move in our life and experience His blessing in our life. Jesus illustrates this in the kingdom of God as this. In Matthew 13, 44 and 45 and 46, He, he explains in two parables how the kingdom of heaven is. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, notice that word joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. In verse 45 it says, and again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The Bible is speaking of this parable is two similar parables that have the same meaning. And, and in this one about the merchant who goes out to seek a great pull. It says there that the merchant in that parable is Jesus. That Jesus is on his business and part of his business is to seek and save that which is lost. And to find those things that have been hidden and lives that have been lost and getting them into the right place. Amen. The parable explains a spiritual truth that applies to our lives and the value that God places on each and every single one of us. Because it says there that the merchant went to look for a pearl of great value. You know, when you think about pearls, pearls are precious. They're considered as gemstones. And the best part, pearls, let me say the best pearls either come from, from oysters or from freshwater mussels. And this choice of metaphor that Jesus uses in this passage is very fascinating and interesting because the Jewish people, they would never have considered a pearl to be precious because in the Levitical law, anything that lived under the water that didn't have fish, that didn't have gills or fins, was considered to be unclean. But Jesus elevates this mussel or oyster, takes it out of the water, and presents a precious, precious, precious pearl. And the pearl in the scripture is speaking about you and I. That Jesus, the merchant, went seeking for a great precious pearl and he found it and in his joy listen here in his joy he went back and he sold everything he had so he could purchase the pearl Jesus left heaven everything he had he had the privileges everything that heaven had to offer Jesus he saw the pearl 
you're the pearl. And if your name is Pearl, you're a double pearl. (laughs) He saw the pearl and he said, I need that pearl. I need that pearl in my kingdom. That pearl is sacred. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give up everything I have and I own so that I can get that pearl. That pearl. Everything I own. And so what happens is Jesus is explaining how the kingdom of heaven works. And one day Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, he's on this discipleship rent. And he's presenting the kingdom manifesto. Like how the kingdom of God operates. And that when you live life like that, and you operate according to the way the kingdom of operates, you, you're going to experience God in a different way to anybody else. And in Matthew 5, he starts speaking about how the kingdom of God operates. And it's a great discipleship rant that he goes on. And, and he's explaining to his followers what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That being a disciple of Jesus Christ is awesome. But, but it's more than just coming to church on a Sunday. Being a disciple is not just singing five songs or four songs together on a Sunday. It's, it's, it's about following Jesus, what, what it means to follow him as a believer. And as he's doing that, he, he starts to tell them that even though this seems difficult in everything that you're going to experience, I'm going to take care of it all. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to take care of everything. What he's saying is that there's some things that you won't be able to do in this manifesto until I die. And when I die, the Holy Spirit's going to empower you to fulfill the way of the kingdom. And look what he says here in Matthew chapter 7, speaking about the kingdom and and these precious pearls. He says, do not give that which belongs to God to the dogs. And do not throw your pearls in front of pigs. For they will break them under their feet and they will turn, sorry, they will turn and tear you to pieces. Yeah, Jesus is saying that we just read in a passage that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes and finds a precious pearl. And then he says in this passage that do not throw your pearl, your life, to the dogs or to the pigs. Because what they'll do is they'll, they'll put them under their feet and they'll trample. Whenever we see in scripture something that's under our feet, it speaks about dominion and authority. The Bible says that heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. God has authority and dominion over the earth. Whenever somebody's foot is on something, it means about the rule and the control, amen? And so what we see is that anything that we don't have rule over in our life, we have given away. And Jesus says in this passage, don't give things away that are precious and sacred. And what God is saying in this passage is that your life is precious and sacred. Your life is a pull and it's set apart. Don't throw it to the dogs. Don't throw it to the pigs, because this is what you know about pigs. Pigs live in mess. They actually thrive in mess. I don't understand these pigs that they put the bows on. You, you just put that pig outside, that bow's gone, baby. <laughs> its nature is to live in mess and trample the things. And what a pig does is it just looks for grain. And so what Jesus is saying is your, your life is so sacred and so precious. It's like a pill that if you, just, if you put that pill in a pig pen, what, you know what the pig's going to do? The pig's not going to walk past and say, man, that's an awesome pull. That's going to make such an awesome necklace for me. No, the Bible says that the pig's just going to be concerned about his own thing. He's looking for grain. And if your pearl is in the way, he's just going to tread on it and squash it. And that pearl is going to be under his feet, under his dominion. The value of the kingdom of God in your life is more than you'll ever know. And he says, don't throw... What is sacred? You see, your new life, you see, your new life in Christ Jesus is very different to your old life. In your old life, you you could have just said things and done things and and behaved in certain ways that that was acceptable at that time. But, But God says, you got saved now. You've been set apart. You may not feel your worth. You may not feel like you're set apart, but I've set you apart. To me, you are sacred. So much so that I, I gave everything to buy you. And church, there's some sacred pearls. You see, pearls are precious and, and they need to be protected in our life. There's some pearls that they, they need to be protected. Why? Because they belong to God. You see, the, the merchant bought the pearl so he could own the pearl. God bought your life with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. 
And the reality is this, is that you have a new owner. You have a new ruler in your life. And his name is Jesus. It's God the Father. It's no longer the devil. No longer the enemy. Your life is sacred to God and you have a new owner. And, and, and we need to protect that which God has set us apart for. Amen? Is this helping you this morning? You see, there's things in our life that we give away that sometimes we don't understand the value of what we're giving away. You see, what was, co- was considered common or, or just flippant in our life is no longer considered that in the eyes of God. You know, marriage in, in the eyes of the world is, it, it's okay just to, to get up and do whatever you want to. But God sees marriage as a sacred pill. And it needs to be protected. Jesus says, don't throw your pills. They're precious. What he's saying is, don't just give your life away to anything and everything. Your life is precious. It's sacred. And if you're going to experience the kingdom of heaven in our life, which God wants us to do, we've got to, we've got to protect those pills that God has entrusted into our life. Amen. Jesus is saying, don't let... Don't let them have authority over your life today. And so for the last few minutes, I want to just speak about maybe five pearls that are sacred in God's eyes that we need to protect. Maybe maybe there's just one of them that you can identify with. Maybe it's just one that you have to, you say, you know what, that's a pearl that I realize that I've given away and I need to get it back because it's sacred. Because when you get that pearl back and you start protecting it, you start experiencing the kingdom of heaven. In a way you never used to. The first pearl that I want to speak about is the pearl of joy. You see, the Bible says that the merchant went out and in his joy. You see, the reality is this, is that before you and I were saved, you know what we used to do? We used to live for happiness. We used to like, man, we're going to do whatever it takes to make us happy. Some people do whatever it takes to make them happy, amen? And so while I, well, outside of Christ, I used to live my life and, and, and happiness used to come through maybe through a bottle, or maybe happiness used to come through socializing. Maybe, there's nothing wrong with that. But maybe happiness used to come through trying to put other people down so you can get, get ahead. And, and happiness comes through different forms be outside of Christ Jesus. Amen. And, and so what happens is people pursue outside of Christ different avenues to find happiness. But happiness only comes from happenings. So when good things happen, then I'm happy. But Jesus says, no, 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 I come and I'll give you joy. And that joy is a precious pearl. And so that joy is to be protected in your life. It's sacred. It's God has given it to you. To, and, and so what I have to do in my life and what you and I have to do, especially in this world that we're living in full of negativity, is that I have, to, I have to protect the pearl of joy in my life. I can't give joy away to what's happening around me. Because joy is something that happens within me. And I really believe that many of us we just give our joy away. We throw the pearl to the pig. And like, I'm not happy with life. I'm not happy with this. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying that we have to live like an ostrich with our head in the ground. But I'm saying, let's talk about things, but not allow them to steal our joy. Let's deal with reality with faith. And I'm not going to give my joy because the leadership of our country is doing crazy things or the world economy is crashing. Because the minute I get discouraged, you know what I'm doing? And I'm saying, I don't want joy anymore. I throw that pull. You know what happens? The dogs and the pigs come and they stand on it. And they squash a precious pull. Joy is a precious pull. The Bible says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, joy can only be found in the kingdom of God. Joy cannot be found in a social club. It cannot be found in a party. You can have fun in all of those. But true joy that doesn't move you or waver in your, cause you to waver in your faith is only found in the kingdom of God. Amen. And God says, I've given you joy. So church, I want to say this. We have to make every effort to fight for our joy. Because if we're not fighting for our joy, and I say fighting, I'm not like South fighting, I'm just saying, <laughs> let's keep our joy. Keep our joy because when I, a joy is too sacred to throw away. See, because when I have joy, I have strength. And when I have strength, I have the ability to call, do what God's called me to do. Don't throw your, joy, your pearl of joy away. The second 
pearl is this, is the pearl of peace. See, peace is sacred. It's something that this world cannot find. Jesus says, peace I give. Peace I give to you, okay? And, and so we try and find peace through success. We try and find peace through different avenues in our life. People do whatever it takes just to experience peace in their life. People will go on a holiday and spend sums of money that they don't have just so they can get in a peaceful environment and find peace. Jesus says, no, no, you came into the kingdom of God. Peace is your companion. Peace is who I am in your life. Be anxious for nothing, but be peaceful and prayerful about everything. Amen. And so we find peace in our life. You only find peace in one place, and that is in the kingdom of God. And so when somebody comes and brings negative news or bad news to you, I have a decision to make with my life. I have a decision to make. I'm holding the pearl of peace. The kingdom of God has given me the sacred pearl of peace. And so when, when bad news comes and the enemy tries to steal my peace and my joy in my life, I'm holding this pearl and I have to make a decision in that moment. Do I protect the peace or do I throw it away and give it to the pigs? You know, I love the story of Jehoshaphat. The Bible says that he was in a battle. God had given him victory and he was in a time after he received victory. It says that the king of Syria came against him. King Sennacherib came against him. And they came with a vast number of armies against Jehoshaphat. And the Bible says that, that initially he was alarmed. Like everything just came up against him. Have you ever experienced everything come up against you? Okay, so that's what happens when you're serving God. Is that the enemy brings an attack against your life. But the Bible says Jehoshaphat purposed in his heart not to lose his peace. And it says that he went to the Lord and he says, Oh Lord God, you're the God of heaven and earth. You're a God that's in control of my life. And the Bible says that he prayed and, and he decided in that prayer right there that, that even though the odds were against him, that he was going to hold on to the peace that God gives him. And the Bible says that because he held on to that peace, God gave him the greatest victory in his lifetime. The enemy comes against us. You have a decision to make. Am I going to agree with him and say, yeah, take my pull? I'm going to say, I'm going to hold on to this because God promised in his word, the kingdom of heaven is about peace, joy, righteousness. I'm holding on to that peace right now. I can have peace in my marriage right now. Because when I fight and the peace, I'm saying, take the pearl. I'm going to hold on to that pearl. I mean, is this helping you this morning? Amen. Amen. The next pearl is this. The pearl of your heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, it says that guard your heart above all else. For out of it comes the flesh, the issues of life. You see, the reality is this, is that hope rests in your heart. See, hope rests in your heart. It doesn't rest in your thinking. It rests in your heart. And, and what happens is when you lose heart, you lose hope. And many of us can lose heart in life because of what life throws against us. And things don't work out in our life. And the enemy comes up against us and he tries to do certain things. And he tries to bring circumstances and challenges and people rise up against you. Work, you get retrenched at work or, or you can't find employment. You've been trusting God and, and you lose heart. And you grow weary when doing well. And God says, no, no, don't lose heart because I've overcome. I've overcome and in the right time I will do what I will do in your life. And so what happens is what we're called to do is to protect our hearts, that, that pull in our heart. Guard your heart with all dil diligence. You see, don't lose heart over your situation that you're facing right now. Because your situation is temporary, but your God is eternal. And when we lose heart right now, we're saying, God, there's my pearl of hope. Don't throw it away. God wants to do something significant in our lives. Amen. I'm not going to give up my heart. I'm not going to give up my hope. I'm not going to give up what God's plan given me through the kingdom, I'm holding them and I'm guarding them. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And it doesn't matter what weapon is formed against me, it will not prosper. All i got to do is hold on to the pearls of God. 
The sacred pearls. The next pearl is this, is that the pearl of hope and confidence. Hebrews 10, 35 says, don't throw away your confidence for you will be richly rewarded. See, our hope and our confidence is in Jesus and in God the Father. See, the reality is this, is that we throw our confidence away when we base our life on external things. And the truth is, as Paul said this, don't put your confidence in the flesh because the flesh is of no value. And so church, we, we start putting our hope and our confidence in God. Uh, listen, when we get up on the stage, when I step out into what God's called me to do, I'm not putting my confidence in my flesh. I step out in God. I've got God confidence, Godfidence, Godfidence, not confidence, Godfidence. I mean, I want to ask you, how are you living your life? Are you living it on confidence or Godfidence? Because when you live it with God on your side, I can tell you now, it doesn't matter what you're facing right now. It doesn't matter what lays ahead of you tomorrow. When your confidence is God, there is no mountain high enough. Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you shall say to it, be removed. And it shall be, I have confidence in God. Though I am weak, I am strong. If I am sick, I am healed. I have confidence in the word of God. Because the word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it can devour whatever the enemy brings against me in Jesus' name. My my confidence is not in Donovan Castle. It is in the power and the might of a living Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> confidence. I'm not going to throw my confidence into the pen. The last one is this. The pearl of forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is a divine thing. The forgiveness is sacred in our life. And when we just don't see it as a sacred act, we never understand the value of it. It's Jesus came for one reason only, to forgive mankind of this sin. And he hung on that cross, it was sacred. And he's given us, you and I, the ability to forgive each other. And when I say I'm holding on to that pull of forgiveness, and I'm not going to just throw forgiveness away, what I'm saying is this, is that I don't really care what you've done to me and who was wrong and who was right in the situation. I'm holding on to that sacred pull of forgiveness and, and it's sacred and so I give it in faith. And I choose to not throw my forgiveness away. So I'm going to forgive people that have said wrong things about me. Forgive people that have violated me. I'm not talking about all of us here, not just me. I'm not going to throw that pearl of forgiveness and say, you know what, I don't care what happens to them. I don't, I'm, you're throwing forgiveness to the pigs. God says, no, you hold those, those pearls are sacred. They're precious in my eyes. Hold on to them. So I'm going to choose to forgive just as Christ forgave me. Because the Bible teaches us in the Lord's Prayer that, that if we don't forgive each other, how can God forgive you? God says, I, I, I can't forgive you if you don't forgive those who have wronged you. Because forgiveness is sacred. And when you truly understand the forgiveness of the cross, that forgiveness doesn't just come to you, it now flows through you. And so I, I forgive. I'm holding on to that pull. You see, these pulls are precious. And the only way to protect these pearls is to put them in the hands of the merchant. And he helps protect them. And when I need to call on joy, I go to him. When I need to call on for peace, I go to him. When I need my confidence to be where it needs to be in him, I go to him. When I need to forgive a brother or a sister who's wronged me, he holds that pull and I say, I need that right now. And I go to him. And it all flows through me. Because the kingdom of heaven is not distant. It's within. It's within. You are the pearl of great value. Your life is different to what it used to be. Your norm has changed. You have a new normal. And when people that don't have peace, you have peace. When people are looking for joy, you have joy. When people are unforgiving, you are forgiving. 
when people have lost their hope and their confidence in life, you are confident and bringing hope into life because of the great merchant, Jesus Christ. Come on, we bow our heads right now as we close. While every head's bowed, every eye's closed. This morning, I want to ask you how is your relationship with God? See, the kingdom of heaven is not about feelings, it's not about being good or it's not about being bad. It's about relationship with Jesus Christ. It's personal, it's not through somebody else. It's a one-on-one relationship. And maybe this morning you don't know Jesus Christ personally. You've heard about him. You've sung about him. You've even been to church. But you've never, never, ever made it a personal decision in your life to have him as your Lord and your Savior. Today he wants to be a part of your life. He gave everything to have you. I'm going to count to three and you'd say, you know what, that's me. I, I want Jesus. I need to accept him in my life. I want to ask you on the count of three won't you just raise your hand where you are and God will do something amazing in your life one the Bible says for God so loved the world we just read a story about how this merchant sold everything he could to find the pearl you are the pearl today he loves you the second thing is this is that God's plan for your life is so much greater than yours and you can only find hope and peace within him today he loves you with an unconditional love This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we read there in the scripture that no man gets to heaven unless he is born again. Unless you're born again, you don't get to heaven. You don't get to see God's kingdom. Jesus said it's very simple. You just believe in me and accept me as your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, you've never done that. You've never committed your life to Jesus. I want to ask you right now, won't you just raise your hand? Right where you are. And I want to include you in the prayer. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Hands going up. Hands going up all over. Why don't you just keep your hands up high where you are if you don't mind. It's everybody's hand. Hands going up all over. God loves you this morning. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. He's got a new life for you. Thank you. Maybe there's one more person here. One more person as I look across. You'd say, you know what? I need to make that decision with my life today. I know I need to. I want to I want to urge you. I want to spur you on and say, why don't you just do it today? Come on. Make the greatest decision of your life. Don't wait for tomorrow. Do it today. If that's you, just raise your hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe yeah, while every head's bowed, you you serve God. You followed him. You lived your life. But for some reason, life and its challenges have got to you. You've made some decisions that that have taken you off from following God. And you'd say, you know, Donovan, I need to recommit my life. Pastor, I want to get my life right with God today. I've pearls, there's been pearls that I've just, I've just squandered. I want to recommit my life to God. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand as well and we'll include you in that prayer. Thank you. Just keep your hands up high wherever you are. Thank you. Hands going up. Hands going up all over. Thank you. You can put your hands down. While every head's bowed, every eye's closed, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So I want to ask you this morning, if you raised your hand on any one of those two occasions to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer out with boldness and confidence in your heart. Because when you pray this prayer, you're going to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the rest of the church, we're going to pray together. Won't you help me as we lead these people in prayer? Let's pray together. Father God. I thank you for sending your son Jesus who died on the cross for me and has forgiven me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you today to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I commit my life to you. I entrust my spirit to you today. And I live for you today, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and giving me a new life today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.